welcome back to the program. Millions of Ghanaians were left with a massive power outage which affected virtually every part of the country. Gridco Chief Executive William Amuna said, quote, there was a surge of power around 9.40 p.m. and we lost many generators across the country. He expects full power to be restored today. Authorities are still investigating the cause of the blackout, but have suggested it could have been a lightning strike. The last nationwide blackout in January 2016 was blamed on a system failure. Well, Zambian's opposition leader, Hikande Hichilema, who is facing treason charges, is back in court for more hearings about his case. Mr. Hichilema is accused of trying to overthrow the government of President Edgar Lungo. He was arrested last month after the convoy he was traveling in allegedly refused to give way to the president's motorcade. The magistrate's court in the capital, Lusaka, is to decide whether the case should be referred to a high court. The opposition, however, believes the treason charges are an attempt to silence Mr. Hichilema. A parliamentary election is underway in Algeria, where the government says a strong turnout is essential for the country's stability. The National Liberation Front of President Abdelaziz Bouteflika is expected to retain its majority in parliament with its coalition ally, the Rally for National Democracy. But despite Algeria's urgent economic problems, there's still little sign of enthusiasm among voters, many of whom have become disillusioned by what they see as a failure of the government to keep its promises. The political system remains essentially presidential in nature, so the parliament does not have much power. At the moment, analysts say it's the poor health of President Bouteflika that's of major concern to Algerians. Hey, Nigeria, the United Nations has once again warned that millions of people face hunger in wasteland recaptured from Boko Haram terrorists. Some 4.7 million people in northeast Nigeria depend on food aid, some of which is blocked by militant attacks. Yet more help is needed, uh, but uh, more is held up by lack of funding, and some diplomats say it's stolen before it can re even reach those who need it. When he heard the Nigerian army had declared his family's hometown of Banki free from Boko Haram militants and safe to return, Bukhar Abdul Qadir did all he could to bring his family back to the place they had fled three years ago. It took nine months of hunger, including selling most of the food rations they received at their refugee camp in Cameroon, to save up for the cost of a two-day journey in a lorry back across the border into northern Nigeria. Instead of returning to till the familiar fields of home, they came back to a desolate wasteland littered with the rubble of destroyed buildings and burnt cars where they were herded into a crowded camp by soldiers. The once thriving town, which the army retook in September 2015, has been burnt to the ground. Along with some 32,000 other homeless inhabitants, Abdul Qadir's family are now confined to the camp amid the ruins guarded by troops who do not let them out unescorted, officially to protect them from explosives strewn across farmland. What we want from the government is to help us. We don't have wood to cook. We don't have anything in our hands, even soup to wash. As you see, this sign on my face is a sickness because I have no money to take care of it, so I left it like that. If possible, we want the government to open our roads and markets. Let them not leave us like that in order to start up with our businesses. Nigeria's security forces have succeeded in recapturing most of the territory once held by Boko Haram militants after years of an insurgency in which civilians were often the target. Instead of bringing a joyous end to the conflict, the victories have revealed communities gripped by hunger. At another northeastern camp, in Gamburu, Ngala, army units are trying to accommodate a new influx of thousands. We only have four nurses and one medical doctor to cater for this number of people. So it is not enough to deal with, with, with their medical challenges. And there is no secondary health facility in the whole of Ngala local government. There's no secondary health facility. So it's a major challenge. And then finally, shelter. A lot of people that are coming now, shelter is a major challenge now. 
Aid agencies and military officials say the rainy season will make many roads inaccessible, increasing the dependence on food aid as farming halts and the movement of goods becomes restricted. Cesar Sishilombo, who heads the sub-office of the UN Refugee Agency, Meiduguri, says up to 3 million people are at risk of famine in areas recently recaptured from Boko Haram. He says aid agencies working in Nigeria face a funding crisis. Uh, you, you know the page which has been done, it is uh, almost 1 billion, or 1 billion plus. And uh, there have been a lot of commitments uh, for the donor community. For example, in the Oslo conference, uh, people have pledged. But the, uh, I can say the promise is not yet translated into... Western diplomats, however, say corruption and government mismanagement are partly to blame for the failure of aid to reach those in need. Finally, on the program, journalists yesterday gathered in Cameroon's largest city, Douala, to mark World Press Freedom Day, where they also called on authorities to respect press freedom. There's been growing concerns over limitations put on journalists in Cameroon following the recent sentencing of a journalist as 10 years in prison on terrorism charges. People in Cameroon accuse the government of trying to muzzle independent media and civil society, especially those that are critical of the regime. We are here today to be able to press the will of a free people who wants to be free and who wants to continue to be free. Cameroon passed an anti-terrorism law in 2014, which was created to help combat militants from Nigeria-based Boko Haram, whose fighters regularly launch attacks in Cameroon. But many journalists here say that the law has been increasingly used by authorities to restrict journalists and freedom of expression in the country. On April 24th, a Cameroonian military tribunal sentenced Ahmed Abba, a journalist, to 10 years in prison on terrorism charges, including for failing to report acts of terrorism to authorities in a trial that has drawn sharp criticisms from right groups. The court has been told that evidence was found on Abba's computer showing that he had been in contact with Boko Haram Islamic militants and that they had communicated information to him about a future attack. But Abba's sentence has drawn outrage from right groups and other journalists. We all knew from the beginning that that law was unique when it was first introduced. It's true that at the beginning, the law was introduced under the pretext of curbing insecurity against Boko Haram. But even during the state of emergency in the country, does not justify the enactment of a special law whose first effect was to restrict press freedom. The Central African country's veteran ruler, Paul Bia, has faced international censor for alleged human rights violations in recent months, including the protests in Cameroon's two Western English-speaking regions. Organizers of this protest are currently on trial, charged under the same anti-terrorism law used against ABBA. That's Network Africa. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers. Bye for now.